Well, we begin our story with a consideration of uh, Sly Stone and Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, we will, when we think about the people who are uh, most important in helping shape the way black pop um, developed over the course of the 1970s, there are two names that really sort of begin uh, our, our study. Uh, James Brown is one, and we'll deal with uh, James Music a little bit later a couple, in, in, a, in a couple of lectures. For now, I want to focus on the important role of uh, Sly Stone and his uh, his, uh, his group Sly and the Family Stone and, and how that led to a kind of rise of funk um, in black pop uh, in, the, in the first half of the 1970s. Uh, Sly Stone is an interesting uh, guy because he comes out of the primarily white rock scene in San Francisco at the end of the 1960s. So Sly is, is, is in that same scene with people like the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane, many of the groups that we talked about in week seven of part uh, one of this course. Um, and so his group really rises out of that, though isn't really thought of as a, a San Francisco band. I don't think most people would think of them sort of in the same breath as, as, as a Grateful Dead uh, and Jefferson Airplane and the rest of them, Janis Joplin groups like that. But in fact, he was really uh, a part of that scene. The, the, the sound that he's, the style that he's responsible for primarily is called psychedelic soul and it's the, 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 the um, key features of that are an emphasis on groove uh, that is setting up a kind of a repeated kind of rhythmic kind of feel that's often laid down between the bass and the drums and then the other instruments play. It's not so much like melodic or harmonic instruments sometimes as much as like every instrument in the band is kind of a percussion instrument. It sets up an intricate and hip kind of interlocking of different parts to create a kind of a groove. So rather than the, the, the music sort of um, taking advantage of a lot of you know, interesting and complicated chord progressions or various kinds of things like that. It really sort of sets up a groove and then all the music kind of rides on top of that. There are catchy hooks in the lyrics, you know, phrases and things like that that come back that sort of catch the listener's ear and some great horn arrangements um, that go along with all this and sort of ride along the top of that. So that, that sound is really developed by, by Sly Stone and was extremely influential in the artists that, uh, that, that came after him. Uh, a good example of, of early Sly would be Dance to the Music, a number nine R&B hit. Already in 1968, uh, there's a double, a double A-sided single, Stand and I Want to Take You Higher, uh, from 1969. Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself, again, was number one on both the R&B and the pop charts in 1970. And what's interesting about uh, Sly is that he was marketed um, really across um, uh, racial lines. So, you know, it was really quite possible if you were listening to FM Rock to hear something by Sly and the Family Stone when mostly, as I'll, as I'll say during the course of these lectures this week, most of the, 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 the music that we're talking about did not get heard so much on FM Rock Radio. Sly Stone uh, was one of the uh, important uh, exceptions and so that crossover really did a lot to define for white audiences what they thought black music must be sounding like though they weren't hearing uh, a whole lot of it. Um, the group was also interesting because it was integra integrated both in terms of uh, race, both black and white members, and in terms of gender, both men and women uh, in the group. Well, so then there's a whole series of groups that really sort of pick up what Sly gets started and, and work that style to continue to develop it here uh, into the 1970s. So we can start with a group from Dayton, Ohio, uh, called the Ohio Players. These guys were formed as first as Robert Ward and the Untouchables all the way back in 1959. They quickly became the Ohio Untouchables and then finally the Ohio Players. Um, they first broke through in 1973 with a, a, a kind of a novelty record called The Funk Funky Worm, uh, kind of a, a kind of a, a, a funny uh, lyric and uh, vocal that went with it, and then a kind of a synthesizer sound that was supposed to be the sound, I guess, of the worm dancing or whatever, or moving or grooving or whatever it was. It was one of those kinds of catchy uh, AM novelty record kinds of things that really brought these guys to the top of the charts, number number one in the R&B charts, number 15 in the pop charts, and they followed with tunes that were a lot more sort of in the Sly Stone kind of style, uh, a big a big tune that was number one on both the R&B and the 
the pop charts a number uh, in, in 1974 called Fire, and then another uh, number one hit in 1975 called Love Roller Coaster. Uh, cool and the Gang, coming from Jersey City, New Jersey, were formed as a jazz group called the Jazzy X in 1964, while some of the members of the group were still in high school, uh, led by a fellow named Robert Bell. He's the bass player, and he's cool in Cool and the Gang. Uh, after they were the Jazzy X, they changed the name to Cool and the Flames, and then eventually became Cool and the Gang. Their big breakthrough came in 1973 with um, an album called Wild and Peace and a track called Jungle Boogie, number four on the pop charts, number two on the R&B charts, uh, following up uh, with Hollywood Swingin'. Uh, during the disco years, Cool and the Gang had a couple of really, really big hits. That is later in the 70s, and we'll come back to that uh, as we get to the end of this week's letter, uh, lectures. In 1979, Ladies' Night, and in 1980, Celebration. So, um, uh, for those of us who live in the United States, if you've been to a wedding reception at any time uh, since 1980, you've probably heard the band play Celebration. It's one of those kinds of staple tunes that gets played all the time. At least it, it did. I may be dating myself a little bit by saying that. But anyway, Cool in the Gang, uh, an important extension of the Sly Stone style and approach, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Another group that was uh, a, kind of an extension of what Sly got going, uh, started by formed by Maurice White, who was a drummer, a, a kind of a jazz drummer and a studio drummer in the Chicago area, played as a studio drummer for, for, for chess records in the 60s, uh, played drums with the Ramsey Lewis Trio uh, for a while. But then he moved to L.A. Uh, in 1969, uh, met Phil, uh, Philip Bailey, who became the, the lead vocalist for the group, and formed this group, Earth, Wind, and Fire, um, known for their sort of sophisticated and intricate horn arrangements, in addition to sort of catchy melodies um, uh, uh, that, that, that rode on top of these, 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 these great grooves. Um, some important uh, recordings from them, uh, the, the big one for them was a big number one album called That's the Way of the World in 1975, features the songs Shining Star, which was a number, number one hit, and, and the, the title track, That's the Way of the World, which got to number 12 on the pop charts, number five on the R&B charts. Um, it was written for uh, a, the movie of the same name, That's the Way of the World, uh, that was a, a, a movie about the record business, uh, which featured Harvey Keitel, and the band members in the group actually make some cameos. That's not the only time we're going to talk about Earth, Wind, and Fire and music for movies, but I don't want to anticipate my story too much. Um, if I would give you one Earth, Wind, and Fire track to check out, I would, I would say that for me, um, the 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 one that I enjoy the most is their version of the Beatles' Got to Get You Into My Life. Uh, they did it in 1978. It was a number nine pop hit, number one R&B hit. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastic arrangement that really highlights all the things that are, that are hippest uh, about, about Earth, Wind, and Fire, I think, in many ways. It was recorded for a, a Sgt. Pepper movie. And in this Sgt. Pepper movie, this, the four uh, Beatles were played by the three Bee Gees plus Peter Frampton. Now, in 1978, you have to understand the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton were the biggest names and the pop music business. So they put this movie together around Sgt. Pepper. It's actually, I don't think, really a very good movie. But anyway, Earth, Wind, and Fire uh, did their Beatles song, uh, and that was Got to Get You Into My Life. Steve Martin, actually, was also in that movie. Uh, another, another group that, that really had a fantastic horn uh, section was Tower of Power, coming out of Oakland, California. In fact, uh, that group, the, the horn section was so hot and had such a, a great reputation uh, in the business in the 1970s that they appeared on albums by all kinds of other artists, notable for us uh, uh, rock historians, albums by Elton John, Rod Stewart, uh, and the Rolling Stones. It was a multiracial group uh, featuring both black, white, and or, or, or featuring black, white, and Latino uh, members. Um, Maybe the, the, the big breakthrough album for them comes in 1973 with their album Tower of Power. And if I were, was going to ask you to listen to one Tower of Power track to really sort of get a, um, uh, an idea of, of what it is these guys did best, I would ask you to check out the tune What is Hip? 
which has got all the kind of groove things and the kind of more sophisticated, almost in some ways sounding uh, a little like jazz in a lot of kinds of ways. Uh, and then finally, in our discussion of groups that extend the Sly and the Family Stone kind of idea of funk uh, into the 1970s, we think about the group called War, which formed in Los Angeles, California. Now, the guys in War were originally in a group called the Night Riders, and uh, they, were, they, they were playing around, actually got a gig to um, back a football player uh, in, in this country by the name of Deacon Jones. As I recall, Deacon Jones played for the Los Angeles Rams back when that NFL team uh, was in Los Angeles. And he was gonna, like a lot of uh, 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 players do, try to create a, a career in, in music. And so he got these guys, the Knight Riders, together. And I guess he did an album. I, you, you, can, you can look it up on the internet and see exactly how that worked out. But anyway, while that was all happening, Eric Burton, who had sung with the animals during the 60s, you know, House of the Rising Sun, we gotta get out of this place. Uh, that Eric Burton saw this group and decided they were so fantastic, he'd like to have them back him. And so he formed the group, they called it Eric Burton and War. Um, they, they, they released an album in 1970 called Eric Burton Declares War. They had a hit with the single Spill the Wine, and then Eric Burton left the group, went on to other things, but the group continued together without Eric Burton and had tremendous uh, success, almost more success without Eric Burton uh, than they did with him, blending Latin feels together with an R&B approach and funk. Uh, the big uh, uh, album for them was probably The World is a Ghetto from 1972, number one on both the pop and the R&B charts. The title track was a number seven hit on the pop charts, and Cisco Kid was even bigger, a number two hit on the pop charts, number one on the, on the R&B charts. And and then Low Rider um, uh, from a couple years later, from 1975, was the number seven hit for them, number one uh, on the Rhythm and Blues charts, and number 12 uh, in the UK. And so those groups together, the Ohio Players, Cool and the Gang, Earth, Wind and Fire, Tower of Power and War, they're all, in many ways, a, a clear extension of what Sly and the Family Stone got rolling at the end of the 1960s. And then as sort of Sly sort of uh, falls out of the picture at the early 1970s, these other groups take that sound, refine it, and turn it into what is one of the sort of mainstream um, the sounds of black pop in the 1970s, the sound of funk. Now we move on in the next video to talk about what was happening at Motown in the 1970s.